about Hot Take Nation. It is DRW here, coming to you live from... Actually, I'm not coming to you live. I want to always say that, but, you know, really, we tape this and then we put it out there, so it's kind of not that exciting. But what I can tell you is not up, and where we're going to start your hot take over your commute this week is natural gas. Falling below $2 in MCF on Friday in what can only be described as a brutal punching to the face constantly for all natural gas producers. It is ugly. It is getting uglier. And if this doesn't get to be a a colder winter, we are going to have gas prices, as I said on my What to Expect in 2020 podcast. You could see gas prices in the dollar fifty to dollar seventy-five. It was a great week for us to visit with Chris Callan, and I had to reconsider my natural gas bear thesis. In particular, that perhaps my bear thesis is maybe natural gas long term is the right play. In fact, I know that it is the right play. The question is when. And what I know in the interim is that if you are a publicly traded company who produces natural gas as a primary, and you are having to keep rigs up to fill your firm transport commitments, this is going to be a horrific year. And speaking of, let's start with EQT this week. EQT came out earlier with a reserve revision. They expect a $1.4 to $1.8 billion charge in Q4, reflecting what can only be described as a uh, a beatdown in natural gas prices. Uh, Everyone knows because uh, we had a lot of information on it this week. I use smog. And uh, not that it was a full smog disclosure coming out of EQT, but they did drop, if I go to my handy dandy spreadsheet, they did drop their smog value from $11.6 billion at the end of 2018 to $8.6 billion at the end of 2019, which impacts about half the value of that uh, net of debt. So $25 per share in 2018 headed down to 14. That doesn't include GNA. That doesn't include interest. That doesn't include the balance sheet. That doesn't include the fact that gas is currently two dollars an MCF. It is ugly. If you are a natural gas producer, uh, man, I just the, the punches just keep on coming. But let's pivot to the second topic of the week. The first real take under that we've seen. Now, you might be wondering, what is a take under? Well, if you check the news, you would have seen that Lillis Energy had its primary shareholder, Varde, make an offer to buy the outstanding remaining shares that they don't own. They have a big pref position in that company. They have some debt uh, that that they own in that company, and they have some common equity that they own. And they offered 25 cents a share, and at the time, Lillis was trading north of 40 cents a share. Now, let's break that down. When I look at their balance sheet, they have around $422 million worth of debt, pref, or prepaid uh, revenue from a sale that they did earlier in the year. And their smog year in 2018, 292. So to me, and I've said this all the way through 2019, one of the leading indicators of uh, a restructuring, let's say, is when your smog value is below the value of your outstanding debt. And in this case, 292, the last time I checked, is below 422. So it makes sense that the offer would come in at 25 cents a share or so, because that's basically the cost that it will take to put that company through restructuring with a lot more lawyers. So um, we've seen our first take under, I think we're going to see more. And as the smog numbers come out in February, I would definitely be looking to make sure that the debt on the balance sheet exceeds the smog amount by a lot. Now, the third topic that I wanted to get into this week is to set the stage for what these are being called debt refinancings. Laredo was one that gave us a great example this week. We had WPX last week and we had range last week. This week, or at the end of last week, I guess, Laredo came out with a billion dollars of new senior unsecured notes, which are priced at 9.5% for about half of them and 10.125%. They are replacing the existing balance sheet debt, which is uh, around... Uh, if I do the math, 800 million at around five and a half, six percent. So that is a huge step up in interest when you're moving from a 6% to a 10%. Now, they've bought themselves some runway. So instead of having debt maturities in 2022 and 2023, they now have debt maturities out in 2025, if I recall right, where, that, uh, where they priced those. So have bought themselves some time, but man, 4% extra. And that just shows how risky some of these balance sheets are when you're having to secure debt at 10%. If I could take all of my money 
and put it in a lockdown debt and guarantee that I was going to get it back and I could get 10% interest, I am doing that all day long. So we know that just doesn't exist in a risk-free product. And it sort of says that when you're seeing refinancings at that roughly 10%, there's some balance sheet stress that's coming and really need to be aware of that as an investor. Now, the final place, I don't, I don't is this even the final place? I, I almost don't want to talk about it. So there is a company, um, I'm just going to call it the artist formerly referred, known, at, known as in Canada. Uh, like what on earth <laughs> were, were the brand people thinking with um, on, 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 on Vitiv, on Vitiv, on, on V, oh, oh, Vintiv, oh, Vintiv, let's go with that. It's just, it's just not good. It's just not good. Uh, had a little blog, had a little fun with that one uh, earlier this week. If you didn't see it, Arose by Any Other Name is the name of the blog. It's obviously on the website. Um, I don't like to pick on people for making bad decisions. Uh, no, actually, I, I do like to make, uh, to pick on people making bad decisions. And changing your name and thinking that you're going to get deeper access to capital pools to me is is insane. Oil and gas companies are valued on two things, the quality of your rock and the quality of your balance sheet. Nobody cares what your name is. They don't care who your management team is, or really they shouldn't. Uh, they care about, can you drill economic wells with the rock you have? And do you have access to capital because your balance sheet is good? If your balance sheet is good, I promise you people are going to find you. You don't need to change domicile and come up with a name that sounds like an erectile dysfunction medication in order to attract new pools of capital. So the, the artist formerly known as Encana has changed their name. And as part of that, they're having a January 29th uh, conference call to go through their Anadarko Basin position. Obviously, there's been a lot of noise around Anadarko Basin in the last six months. Rig count has fallen dramatically. It's sort of fallen almost 60% from the beginning of 2018 to where we are today. Completions have maintained relatively the same pace, but you got to believe that both production in that state uh, in Oklahoma and the number of completions in the activity are going to continue to fall. I think in Canada is trying to stem the tide. So look to that press release or, or rather uh, conference call to really get some insight into how they're seeing the Anadarko Basin and then read through to Devon's position, Marathon's position, Simrex's position, among us others, to see you know what is next for Oklahoma. And finally today, let's talk a little bit about the uh, shareholder letter that came out from uh, Larry Fink of BlackRock. There, I did a post on it Friday. It was one of my longer posts. To be honest, I think it was helpful when LinkedIn limited me to 1,300 characters per day because uh, that's like three paragraphs. And when I get going on a topic, Lord knows I want to start throwing in data and and it just, the, the posts grow. But nonetheless, I do really think that this is important because we talk about climate change. We talk about ESG. We hear about it all the time. And this is one of the largest asset managers in the world with $6.3 trillion of assets under management coming out and saying they really see sustainability, climate change, corporate governance as a major sustainable issue for uh, the capital markets go forward. And as a large investor, of our money because they don't they don't make really active bets through iShares. You buy the market and and uh, so they you they're basically managing your money is the best way I can probably describe it. And they're taking a more active role using some of the weight they have and some of the clout they have with the amount of assets under management to sort of force management teams to do things. As I say in the post, I really speculate that if people really understood what it is going to mean to meet the Paris Accord uh, CO2 reductions and that, that practically carbon credits, if they're not reducing consumption, are not doing anything except creating a derivatives market to trade carbon, to create more financial products for people to spend more time leveraging and making money. If we truly want to address the problem, we need to address the issues and the issues are consumption. Here are some examples that I talked about in the post. 14.5% of worldwide carbon emissions come from livestock. Now, I am a meat eater. I like meat. I like chicken. I like fish. I like beef. I like pork. I mean, I really like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a meatitarian if I really have a choice. If it's green, I really don't want it on my plate. But... Every year, the world 
kills 9 billion chickens to eat. And it takes 9 calories of energy to feed a chicken, which is the most efficient at converting caloric uh, intake into calories that we consume. And it takes 9 calories for a chicken to give us one calorie. So their little chicken legs are running around the green pastures and they're breathing in and breathing out like all the other animals. And that population, which we are specifically breeding, raising, growing to consume, adds to the climate carbon footprint. So if we want to start talking about reductions in our CO2 footprint, I haven't heard a politician say, why don't we make Tuesdays and Fridays vegetarian day? Because that would be unpopular and they would lose votes. Now, how about this one? Um, we consume 20 million barrels a day of oil in the United States, of which 70% is transportation. I know a lot of families that have two cars. I have know a lot of families that have one car. But we all like to live a long way from where we work because we like to have bigger houses. We heat those houses in the winter. We cool those houses in the summer. We spend hours in the car, hence why podcasts are growing so much because we have to do something. We can't be surfing the net on our phone, even though some of us do. We try not to. But uh, we're not reducing materially the way we consume. And really since 2000, energy consumption, even with efficiency, stepping up in every fo form and facet of our appliances, our televisions, our refrigerators, we still consume the same amount of energy today as we did in 2000. So if we want to get serious around climate change and we want to have a real conversation, I would advocate we need to look at the consumer. And so while Larry Fink's letter might be scaring the hell out of all the CEOs out there, it's the consumers that need to change their behavior because if the consumers don't change their behavior, CEOs are going to continue doing what they've always done, and that is figuring out a way to maximize profit. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the hot take over your commute. I am your host, DRW. We'll be back next week. Have a great interview coming up with Joe DeDominic of Anschutz next week for our longer version. And until then, follow us on the web, www.hottakeoftheday.com. Listen to our old podcast there, catch up on all your archives, and drop me a note anytime. Until the next time, be good, be safe, and have a great week. Bye for now. Thank you.